Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Johnny's Juke Joint. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for coming back again this week on, I always forget the dates, on Friday, July 2nd. There we go. Uh, this evening's a guest is uh, a former professor of mine and conductor uh, of mine from uni my university days. And he's an award-winning and, and a dear friend of mine and, a, and an incredible musician and that I've had the chance of playing with through my professional career. Uh, he's an award-winning saxophonist, teacher, composer, author, uh, and, con and conductor who's based in Calgary, Alberta. He's a professor of music at the University of Calgary from 1990 until now, and he performs as a jazz and a classical and a free improviser, uh, primarily on the saxophone. However, he's also uh, an incredibly adept woodwind doubler and performs as a, a flautist, flautist, and I just like that word, uh, clarinetist, uh, and, and in his bio it says penny whistle, which I have to ask him about because I've never, I've never heard him play that and now I want to write something for him to play on that. Uh, he's also um, uh, he's also at the University of Calgary School of Creative and Performing Arts. He's been a conductor of the wind bands and the jazz bands there throughout his career there. And Dr. Brown teaches courses in improvisation, instrumental music education, and the scholarship of teaching and learning. Uh, he is uh, in his 23rd year as conductor of the Calgary Wind Symphony and he plays, also plays tenor one in the Calgary Jazz Orchestra. Uh, please um, put your hands together, not that we can hear you. Maybe some uh, hellos and stuff in the chat would be nice uh, for Dr. Jeremy Brown. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, Johnny. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, I, I will read the rest of your, um, I, I could read your, your bio, but it would probably take up all our time, I think. There's so much. Well, you, get old, you just get old and older. <laughs> It just piles up, you know. <laughs> well, your your career is extremely extensive and varied, um, and we could honestly do multiple shows just on your academic achievements and awards. I think, um, but I'd like to get into the heart and substance uh, of what makes a great educator and a great performer using your experiences as examples. Um, so, a little bit of background: um, you you grew up in Spokane, correct? Correct. And what was, uh, what was that like, a young, uh, playing flute at the time, is that right? Yeah, um, flute and, and saxophone. I started on the yeah. saxophone. Okay. And um, we were in a Central Valley School District uh, in the, the suburb of Spokane, um, just to the east coast of the Idaho border. Great music programs. And uh, my band directors uh, in junior high, well, I had three of them, Ray Timoney, elementary school, uh, then John Frucci at junior high school, uh, junior high school, and then Mel Clayton, an award-winning and nationally recognized music educator in high school, um, the president of uh, the um, uh, Music Educators National Conference, as it was known uh, some years ago. So I was really blessed with you know great um, public school music programs, and then also my mother, being a music teacher uh, and a musician herself. She started uh, all uh, all the three of us kids on lessons early on. So I started saxophone in the fifth grade, flute in grade wow. eight, uh, and then uh, clarinet in in high school. Were my three major instruments. That's early, uh, fifth grade. That's really early. Yeah, for a wind instrument. Yeah, that's that was amazing. Typical. The typical for the school the the school district at that time was grade five uh, for beginning band. Oh yeah. wow, that's great. Well, I, the first thing that struck me is the fact that you remembered the names first and last of of your teachers that were good can you could you tell do you remember any of the names of any of your your mediocre or bad teachers <laughs> like we just don't care do we like oh no i you know i you know i i don't think i had any mediocre teachers i mean i could go on really? uh, sylvia baker um mr thomas dick thomas was one of the best teachers i ever had when i started saxophone a great teacher he taught at central valley high school francis risden the uh, principal flautist with the symphony uh, Spokane Symphony, Gail Coffey, Spokane Symphony, um, Robert Miller, Washington State, Jim Shefflin, Washington State, um, Jim Hill, Craig Kirchhoff. Um, I mean, I, I've just been, you know, all great teachers. That speaks to the importance of lineage and what we do in our career, in our in our path. Absolutely. Yeah. Whether whether the path for a musician is is most musicians straddle education and performance, but whether it's more on one side than the other the lineage is so important because um, even if kids don't go on 
when they're studying don't go on to be professional musicians or professional music educators it, it creates you've seen a lot of that because at the university you've you've taught a lot of students that are um, not music majors uh, but they're somehow in the program in a band you're directing or a and what do you see it do for them if, if say like someone's in chemistry or they're in there it's com something completely different what do you see it do for them when they're students in university I think one of the, the primary things, and I, I saw it even this year, you know, teaching classes on, on Zoom to students that, you know, aren't in the music program, mm -hmm. is it gives them a sense of um, release, they, they would say, self-described, they would say, it's a great release, I can walk away from my math classes, for instance, and I'm, in, I'm, I'm so joyful making music, I'm so happy to be here, this is such a great release, mm -hmm. um, you know, a creative outlet. Um, you know, all the things that we, we know that the arts can do, particularly music can do. And, um, you know, I see it uh, all the time with uh, my, my music, uh, not only my music students, but the non-music students. And sometimes they're the most exuberant, you know, the, the, the students that I have outside of music, uh, because it's, it's something special to them because they're not engaged in it every, every single day. Right. Yeah. The, um, you know, you know, I was just going to say the other thing that I, I just I need to uh, <laughs> since we're talking about me uh, kind of growing up my parents without my parents this I, I, I'm really convinced that I would not do be doing what I'm doing today they were behind me 100 percent they you know wow. lessons musical instruments encouragement you know unconditional love um, all that stuff so that's thanks Urban and Norma you're the best that's, you're the best that's amazing too isn't it yeah um, wow yeah Already, you've brought up so many interesting things to talk about. The um, so so let's. Well, what 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 did you want to be when you were a little kid? So you you wanted to go into music, but what did you want to be when you were a little kid? <laughs> the um, I can remember my dad asked me that maybe I'm in junior high school. I because I I I don't think there was any pressure to particularly do anything. Um, and I remember, you know, the, the, the typical answer, of course, is any obedient son was a doctor, uh, <laughs> or, yeah. and I think I said, or high school, uh, teacher, music teacher. And I kind of held on to that for, you know, quite a, until maybe into, into high school. Right. And then I realized that maybe some kind of combination of, of teaching and performing was where I wanted to go. And then as I got a little bit older, I think I, that's where I, I wanted to be a college university teacher and so that that was something that I've wanted to to do from an early age was uh, relatively you know my early teens maybe uh, 14 15 was to be a university or college teacher oh wow um, yeah and and uh, I, I never I don't think I ever really thought of myself being like a you know a soloist career um, uh, probably because um, you know performing has always been something you and I were talking before the show it's not the easiest thing in the world, you know, for, for me, it is for some people, for me, I have to ramp myself up to get on stage and, and then afterwards, it's always a glowing, terrific feeling, but beforehand, it's, you know, death by a thousand uh, cuts, mm. <laughs> sometimes, not always. Well, let's, let's talk about that then, stage fright, mm. performance anxiety, um, mm. what causes it in us? Because you're talking about having experience with it, but ramping yourself up and overcoming it and then succeeding or yeah. failing, as the case sometimes could be. <laughs> and then, But still, at the end, you say you're left with a glowing feeling. So what, what, what helps us get past that? Well, you know, just purely from my perspective, um, stage fright is something that exists personally for me, not just playing my instrument. Um, but, you know, public speaking, just being in front of people, um, I, I think other people share that. I mean, a, a good example, I'm, I'll never forget this. When I was grade six, I had quite bright red hair. And so the Cub Scouts put on a skit for, you know, 100 parents and school people in the gymnasium at my elementary school. And I was Mr. Carrot because I had the orange hair. And, but I was wearing a, a sack over my head, paper sack with little cutouts. And then there was like, you know, carrot things sticking out the top. <laughs> and, and I had like one sentence I had to say something like, and I'm Mr. Carrot Top. And I was so terrified. I couldn't say a word. I just stood there. 
wow, with a sack over my head. Yeah, and the, <laughs> the den, and the and the den master, a very nice lady, whispered the line to me about three times, and finally she just said the line for me, and then I the, the show went on. She but knew. I, you know, so I think there's kind of a genetic predisposition maybe to being anxious, but you know, to to answer your question. Yeah, I mean, I played, now I perform thousands of times in my career, thousands of times. And um, I think I look at it as something that builds character. It's like, I have to overcome this to live with myself. Um, and I know that it'll be fine, you know, and I need to do this to be a musician and for to further my career and to uphold my commitments to, you know, friends, colleagues and professional uh, sorts of commitments. And mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I've, I, I've just made that commitment to do it, um, you know, sweaty palms and all, and then you do it and then you're done. And it's like, okay, I, you know, I, I survived. I, <laughs> I survived. I've survived. I'll live for another day. And <laughs> <laughs> but are you glad you did it after? Yeah. Yeah. Generally speaking, I am. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, almost 99% of the time, you know, when I play with a CJO, you know, for instance, um, before solo or something, I'll be anxious and then. You know, afterwards I sit down and you hear the applause and, you know, it's like, oh, great. Yeah, I'm glad. I mean, I'm glad it's kind of over, but at the same time, <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, that went, that went pretty well, you know. I, th I think I played some things that I, I can be proud of. <laughs> wow. That's, um, you know, I got to tell you, just shooting from the hip, it's, it is, it is, as you know, it's so normal to have those thoughts and those inner that you're even saying, I'll say to myself, we have those inner thoughts of we're about to perform or we're getting in stage in front of somebody or we're about to do something that terrifies us. Yeah. And, and I had this, I, I went through this a number of years ago where I had to go, okay, well, I, I don't know if you remember this, but I was playing in your uh, concert, uh, uh, Wind Symphony. Yep. Yeah. And um, I, well, I have, I have my horn here. So I, I was, I was playing and you had us doing a, a classical, beautiful classical antiphonal piece. Mm -hmm. And, oh no, I haven't played yet today either. So this is gonna add to the fun. <laughs> um, and uh, it started on uh, a concert C, so a trumpet player's D. And for any of the brass players out there, we always have to put our, our tuning slide out to get that D in tune. And we were antiphonal and I was playing one of the antiphonal parts way up in the side of the theater and it was just a dress rehearsal. It wasn't that I think I did it on the gig pretty okay. But but I was so nervous because you you're I'm behind you, right? So I'm watching your hand and you I don't know if right. you remember this, and you cue and I yeah. have to play, and I was so terrified of being out of tune on that note, because it's such a trouble note. Yeah. And so I think and it was completely unintentional, but I think I went uh, like some kind of like really drawn out lump yeah. and <laughs> and uh, and you stopped everyone and I remember the look of um, hor <laughs> disgusted horror maybe on your face and I went okay okay and then I went because that's part of the fear you're you're fearful of your peers or your conductor or your audience yeah. and so I went and and practiced that literally just coming in on a D with a tuner for yeah. about four hours before we did the concert that night. Good for you. Um, yeah, that's what well, we do. But it was like the it was it was the fear that the reason I screwed it up in the first place was the fear of screwing it up. Yeah, that made me screw I, it up. I know. I, I totally I totally understand what you're saying. Isn't that the craziest thing? It's crazy. So I think that there's something strange when 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 I tell somebody I'm an introvert, I'll especially be, be shocked. And I'm like, no, I'm very introverted. Um, but introverts tend to really fall in love with art and music in a, in a different way. Maybe I don't know. Um, but, but they fall pretty deeply into, into things, especially when it's music that you can listen to the recordings or something where you can really be alone with your thoughts with it. And and then you get into music because you want to replicate that. And then all of a sudden you realize you have to do that in front of people. <laughs> and that's, um, I, I think there's this crazy paradox in the career choice that um, or, or teaching. Right. You have to stand up in front of a room full of people. Yeah. Um, and do you remember that at all? Or is that just all now that you mention it? I maybe I have a vague recollection of that. You're talking about the fourth line D for a trumpet which can be flat yeah 
And um, I mean, I, I've had so many, Johnny, I've had so many things happen as a conductor with musicians over the years that of course, um, stories I could tell. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and your D natural that particular day was not probably on the map for no it, it wouldn't have been it was just one of those things that made me go i need to go practice you know i need what to i do practice. remember about you you always had a smile on your face and you always had the trumpet up and you were always playing you know with with your you know with your heart uh, that's what i remember oh thanks yeah well i think those are things that are important to me so i'm glad yeah um uh that was a lot of fun i you know when i when i recollect of, of those those days I was a young man. I first met you when I was 17, starting university and uh, and playing in your group. And I was always impressed that you were always, you always remembered, you were either listening to recordings or making notes during rehearsal or logged in your head, something. You remembered last rehearsal and you knew what you were going to rehearse. And sometimes you wrote it on the board. You'd write it like a rehearsal song order, but you mm -hmm. knew exactly which sections we were rehearsing. Mm -hmm. And so I remember that there was many times where we never performed a piece all the way through because you knew which sections you were going to work workshop first and you were so aware of the, the material and you always expected us all to be professionals from the very first day I walked in. Um, that was that I think that was good because you have that high school mentality where, you know, it's kind of OK if you screw up, you know, or yeah. if you're not really yeah. prepared or and there's probably a. Uh, it's a it's a bit of a good thing to get some of the nerves out if you have that but no yeah. it was it was it was awesome it really was um, well it was yeah and you know you you caught me at um, a fairly young uh, stage of my career I, I was still in my thir early 30s I think um, and I look back on it and my my gosh um, I just I thought I was pretty experienced but I wasn't and I was still learning a lot of stuff you know <laughs> yeah Boy. that never changes though right when you look back it's, it's like true. listening to a recording you did five years ago yeah um, i i heard one recently because someone asked me to do something similar for them uh, to write a piece similar for them and i went back and listened to it and i finally had to go you know i'm i'm happy with how that was for that time in my life yeah you know as opposed to yeah you know because it's 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 just a journey um it is Okay, so, well, let's talk about your your university degrees and your experiences as a student. So when you were, now, I, I, I had memorized this and I forgot now, but you did your your undergrad in, uh, it wasn't saxophone, it was flute, wasn't it? Well, it was, it, that's a good question. I, you know, <laughs> it was intended to be saxophone. Okay. And, but I had such a great teacher um, uh, uh, at Washington State that... Um, I spent a lot of my time on flute, and but I practiced both instruments. I made a real point of every day uh, at Washington State University, a great school, by the way. And it's in fact, I'd, I'll be uh, in residence there uh, next year. I was supposed to tour Korea with them last summer, but of wow. course, that was all canceled. Right. Um, the band director there, Dr. Dan Pham, is great, a great guy, um, great colleague, and um, but when I was there in the 1970s. Um, uh, you know, it, I was still under the, the, I still really wanted to be a, like a really great doubler, woodwind doubler. And so I was practicing a lot of flute and then quite a bit of saxophone. And, and I started clarinet quite seriously. Um, but uh, I did probably most of my serious classical repertoire on the flute. <clears throat> you know, the Prokofiev Sonata, the Dutiu Samatin, uh, the Ebert, uh, and, and, um, was under the illusion being young and, you know, a little naive that I could carry both instruments to a very high level, which I, I did, you know, I was the first in the first class when I went to Eastman, I went from Washington state to the Eastman school of music and myself and a fellow named Marcus Schoon were the first two applicants to ever be accepted into the woodwind doubling program at Eastman. And you couldn't be a clarinet and saxophone player because those were two reed instruments. You had to be a double reed player and a flute player or a saxophone player and a double reed player. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't be in the same family, hmm. um, which uh, is somewhat unusual. And, you know, I studied with all the primary professors there and, um, uh, you know, was played some music. I was, I was offered a job to go on, on the play uh, on the road with Paul Anka, hmm. things like that. And it was really tempting, but I, 
I made the choice again to follow the academic uh, route, and and uh, which is what I've been doing since. So I taught six years in Grand Prairie, mm-hmm. um, uh, lovely Alberta. school, in Northern Alberta, lovely yeah. school, uh, very nice community, very you know the really um, uh, potent kind of arts uh, culture going on even the, in the 1980s, and um, and then went to Ohio State for a. Uh, my doctorate. So I left Grand Prairie two years in Columbus and then back to Calgary, uh, the university here. Wow. Uh, so yeah, yeah. And then when I was at Columbus uh, at Ohio State, I was primarily working on a saxophone. A and that was your master's? That was my uh, doctorate. That was your doctorate. Okay. In saxophone. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then I did a lot of coursework in conducting with my, uh, my good friend and mentor, uh, Craig Kirchhoff director of bands there and um uh that was where the my conducting thing um i think took a a nice form and uh and then came to calgary and taught uh, you know the the, the band and um woodwind and music education classes so right 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 um and when when you were uh so before that and then when you were going through all your schooling and and finishing your phd who were your top saxophone heroes um, you know, in the day, um, this, you know, this dates me, I suppose, because vinyl was, you know, vinyl was just giving way to cassettes. What's and... vinyl? <laughs> just kidding. I know. <laughs> I know. Um, so, you know, I was listening to Marcel Mule, Jean-Marie Lundex, Jean-Pierre Rompal, James Galway, uh, uh, you know, on flute and sa- classical saxophone. Mm-hmm. Jazz... Um, you know, jazz for me is, of course, has become um, even a more interesting pursuit for me as I've gotten older. But in those days, I was still more mainly a classical guy, and but I did listen to a lot of Grover Washington Jr., for instance, um, Cannonball, mm-hmm. uh, some Miles Davis. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was always, you know, kind of as typical of my whole career, you know, little drop, little, you know, uh, dollops of kind of a lot of different things. Right. Um, um, how how did yeah. you find that then if you're you're primarily listening to classical players and you, most of your study and your you know every, focus was on that uh, how, how difficult was it to learn jazz language and to learn feel and swing and groove and you know different I, mean, I know for myself as a trouble player I use different articulation and yeah. I know that a lot of and I use different air I use different tone I yeah. get tired um, a lot quicker when I play classical trumpet because I don't do it as much. So I really have to warm up into it so that I can create the sound I want and the, the articulation that I want that my classical trumpet heroes play with. And yeah. then, um, and then, and I, and I get fatigued quicker because because I'm not doing it as much. The muscles are just being used differently. Um, it is, uh, you know, was that difficult? And and the articulate. And I know even for a lot of sax players you'll change mouthpiece and maybe read strength yeah. for yeah. yeah so how is it how, how did you overcome that like what what are the things that someone can do to to open up into that language well it's, um yeah i mean these are really great quest- questions and i i'm not sure i have uh, all the answers and i mean some people would be quick to say uh and i don't mean this to i don't mean this to be a negative comment but they would say, well, if you've been trained classically, you could never be a good jazz player, you know, or you'll never have the feel. It's untrue. Um, <laughs> and I don't think that's true. Yeah. Um, you, you look, I think, was it Phil Woods or, you know, other people studied classically as, you know, young, young people and went on to have great, great careers. Um, so, you know, because I was doing conducting and woodwind doubling, classical saxophone, classical flute, really intensely jazz again was just this little pocket over here Mm -hmm. um so yeah switching mouthpieces and and reeds was a key um looking back i probably didn't really have a developed what i would say a really good jazz feel until my early mid-20s where i started to move because i started to get the the oral you know the, the the sound in my head of how i should be sounding or wanting wanted to sound um, so, so that came from listening and experiencing. And that came from listening and playing live players, recordings, playing with. Absolutely. Yeah. When I went to Eastman, I mean, I just, they, I just was knocked out of my shoes by these great young players, and I was, you know, involved with all the jazz, the jazz ensembles. Um, I think when I went to Eastman, I started in the bottom band, 
And um, by the end of my second year, or by the second year, I was in the top band. Um, but, uh, you know, again, I was naive. I, I could read really well and play anything, you know, pretty well. Um, <clears throat> but the, the feel, the jazz, the whole jazz uh, sense, sensibility was not as developed as I, you know, had, w would have wished and certainly not as, uh, not as well as my colleagues. And, and, you know, and that's been a lifelong pursuit and I still work and I now I just love, you know, I work, I'm working on riffs and licks and, and doing a lot of um, backing track stuff and memorizing tunes and, you know, uh, listening to uh, a lot of uh, uh, Chris Potter mm -hmm. and his transcriptions right now. So, wow. I'm, yeah. well, you know, I'm a fan of, um, um, I have a, a, a you know a, a small roster of students that I always carry. It's it's gotten a little bigger during the lockdowns because I've had time. Um, but the um, I, although I I firmly believe that just listen going to hear great players uh, as much as possible in your area, and that never gets old to me ever. Yeah. And listening to records and then transcribing like transcribing uh, if you love. Uh, I had one student says, oh, I want to play trumpet like Frank Sinatra sings. Well, let's transcribe Frank Sinatra singing. Yeah. Let's learn his phrasing, his style, when he uses vibrato, when he doesn't, when he speaks something versus when he sings it. You know, when he, let, let's talk about all those things because we can completely mimic that on the trumpet. And, yeah. and if we learn tunes from records and then we, then we know them, they stay with us. And then we, we learn the, chord progressions and the improvisation, everything right from a record. You, you pick up what all those incredible musicians that were on the session were doing. You yeah. know, all those nuances become part of your playing and yeah. And, and, and what you're talking about, what you're describing, Johnny, is um, the, the jazz language. And for me, it took me a long time to figure out that, uh, and I don't know if you're like this, but I mean, even in junior high school, I could improvise. I mean, I could play stuff and I, I just thought everyone could. But it wasn't really jazz. It was, I was just listening to like marching band stuff, and then I'd make up a new melody, like from the marching band. Right. In fact, I never, Mr. Frushi, I should, I hope he's not listening. I never <laughs> learned, I never actually learned the marching band stuff. I would kind of, uh, I was too lazy. I would just listen to the parts <laughs> around me and then imitate them and right. put like a pastiche of parts together and then try not to get caught out, you know, playing too loud or the wrong notes at the, you know. Um, but um, it took me then a while to figure out that jazz is actually not that. Jazz is actually a language. Absolutely. And you have to learn to play using that language. And that's a, that's a certain coterie of riffs and patterns and licks and tone and a whole combination of things. And, and that takes a lot of study. It's a lot of hard work. Yeah, and I don't think it ends because the music has become so big that we often have a hard time, musicologists have a hard time putting it into into little, you know, yeah, square peg hole. This well, this was this, and this was it. Like it all blends together and yes, is influenced by each other. And um, I have a student that I, I, you know, my love for for Louis Armstrong because he was one of the first people I heard that made me love uh, creative music. And. Uh, this summer, I said, we're going to work on Louis Armstrong. And the first Louis Armstrong transcription they did, they, they, they went, whoa, this, this is really hard to play. And we've been lifting Chet and Miles and all sorts of things. Yeah. Uh, just technically on the trumpet, what he was playing was, is extremely difficult. And, we're just, and this is when he was like 24 recording the Hot Fives. And I'm like, yeah, um, it is. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a language. And that's the way I talk about it. And that, that's the way I think of it. Um, and that's what I listen for when I listen for a great player. It doesn't, it's not, you know, there are some people like I'll hear Wynton Marsalis play and I hear Freddie Hubbard and that language coming from Freddie Hubbard and coming from Miles Davis and that tradition. But I'll also hear Clifford Brown language and I'll hear, then I'll hear Louis Armstrong language and, and, yeah. and, and King Oliver language. Yeah. And I'll hear all these. And then there are other players that find their voice and he's found his voice and his own language within that, studying that. And there mm -hmm. are other players that, um, like Al Muirhead, who found his voice. Um, I mean, he studied Clifford, and I know he studied um, Louis Armstrong later, but he studied mm -hmm. Clifford Brown and Miles Davis. Those were the cool players yeah. when he was young. And, um, and he's found his, like, 
I mean, he's not going to um, verbatim play what some of those guys could play, but he has his own language now be, that, that he's developed from learning the language of other players. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, to me, that's the, the thing I always listen for in somebody's playing. Like, when I hear you play, um, you have a language that nobody else plays with. And so even as a writer, when I'm writing for, for the, the CJO, I don't think, oh, I should put a saxophone solo in here. Mm-hmm. I think, you know who's going to move this to the next area or, or who's going who's gonna to instinctually know the language that needs to be played on this is, is Jeremy Brown or Shane or Igor or somebody. But I think that's the coolest thing, right? Is yeah. Is, yeah. is Yeah. Um, like Duke Ellington. I mean, Ellington would write for you know, individual voices and, um, and, uh, I mean, I heard the Ellington band, you probably did, well, I don't know if you did or not, but I heard the, the Ellington band live in the 1970s, um, in Spokane and I walked wow. right past Duke Ellington to this day. I'm, I was in a beeline to meet the saxophone section and, yeah. I walked, and he, <laughs> Mr. Ellington looked at me and smiled and I just went right around him, uh, and to talk to the saxophone section. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what a fool. I mean, uh, you probably had incredible conversations with the saxophone section, too. Um, I asked him what kind of reeds he used. Okay. And, and he looked up at me and said, Rico. And then he held up the box. And then he basically was hungry, I think, and wanted to go eat. So Right, which is... Which, I don't blame the, the I don't man. blame yeah. him, yeah. yeah. The, um, but it's it's interesting, too, in that situation... You were so excited. I'm a, I'm going to put words in your mouth. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you were so excited about getting to hear them and about what they did that you just wanted to connect with them. You just wanted yeah. to basically say hi. That's right. And and when you're a young student, you know, I remember once meeting Terrence Blanchard and I just said, "What should I what should I practice?" And he goes, "You practice all your regular trumpet stuff." I'm like, "Yep." And he goes, "Lift your favorite. Uh, do you transcribe solos?" And I said, "Yes." And he said, just take your favorite 251 lines, you know, through 251 chord progressions and um, or, or licks from your favorite players and play them through the keys. Mm-hmm. Like, and that was, you know, but I, all I just really wanted to do was walk up to him and say, Terrence, you're freaking amazing. Yeah, like, exactly. You know, like, <laughs> oh man. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, I never got to hear Ellington, um, Ellington's band. I was, um, I was born at the end of the seventies. So I, unfortunately, I think I was just born in the wrong era. Um, <laughs> But I'm going to play something here. Um, I have to find this. Um, but it's, th- this is, and this is what I'm talking about to everyone listening. Um, this is, uh, I normally would have had this queued up. Here we go. So, and uh, as I'm learning to be better at this whole, um, uh zoom thing it's kind of a whole new uh, thing we've entered into speed it's got its own pace it does this whole Um, zoom thing yeah okay so this was this was a song i wrote uh that we recorded on on the christmas album and um and i and i I wanted you to solo in this so bad and you did and what you played was not what i expected um and, and this was the first take and to me I've actually sent so many students to to this recording uh, because of you weren't playing uh, you were playing language, but you weren't playing language. You weren't you weren't uh, what am I trying to say? You weren't regurgitating language. You were just playing with soul uh, right out on your sleeve, just completely. Um, let, let's just listen to this. I'll see if you remember oh. this. <laughs>
I, I think I do. It makes me tired to listen to it. Oh, it makes um, you but, tired. Yeah. It, I can tell you, uh, it makes me feel that everything's all right in the world when I hear that. Thanks. Um, it's soulful and real and powerful and um, I love it. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm, I was kind of pleased to hear it. I, I, um, uh, it, yeah. I mean, I, Johnny, I don't listen to my stuff very often. I think Miles, I'm not putting myself in this class of Miles Davis. Apparently, Miles Davis would never listen to his, or he went on record as saying he doesn't listen to his stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm the same. It's it's painful for me to listen to, to stuff that I record. <laughs> um, oh, and but bad. thank you for playing that. I I enjoyed I enjoyed that. I think it's important every now and then to. Uh, I mean, I, I I I don't I don't listen to. I don't listen to stuff I've, I've, I've played on, um, but I listen to stuff I've written for other people to play on, things okay. like that. Yeah. And so when I hear that, I just go, uh, I, I feel happy and proud that I, that I wrote a tune um, that, that enabled that to happen and then, and then wrote it for big band and strings. And, and that's and your such, tune, right? That's your yeah, tune. Yeah, that was yeah. one of mine. I um, love that. Bop, bop. Yeah, it's fine. Thing. Yeah, like that. <laughs> um, the uh, the but when I hear yeah when I go back and I hear you playing on that and I hear the players we play with playing on things I've done that's when I um, I think even that's why I really like Sweet Jubilation because most of it just featured everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, there are tracks where all I like in the studio while I was I was just conducting I wasn't playing at all. Um, and uh, I-, I loved it, but uh, think, but that to me is one of the soulfulest recordings ever. And I honestly point a lot of people towards just just that f- four and a half minutes into "Long Way to Go." Um, well, thanks. It, it's very flattering. The only thing I can think of to say, really, uh, to, to further your comment is, um, and I'm not sure I'm right about this, but you know, Norman Grant's um, John Hammond, these. Uh, very luminous um, record producers and promoters were uh, were quick to say that they lamented the demise of swing music as it moved into bebop because they felt that bebop music lacked the emotional uh, personality, the the you know the closeness to to the, the the feelings of passion and emotion that we can express. I don't know that that's true, but um, there was you know a lot of folks that lamented the passing of the swing. Era, which maybe was a little bit more personal, mm-hmm. uh, and and in some ways uh, uh, more expressive. I, you know, I don't know about if I'm right about this, um, but sometimes I feel like it's easy. And your your point about that piece um, is one side of my playing because the other side of it is that I really get caught up sometimes in trying to play you know fast note you know Coltrane style yeah. bebop lines, and I can I find that endlessly challenging and rewarding. Um, but there's nothing like a great blues gospel tune, you know, to really expose your your inner uh, feelings, your soul. Yeah, I, and that's uh, I think that's that's the part. As as much as I love bebop language, playing it and listening to it, attempting to play it, you know, studying it, that kind of stuff. But um, <laughs> yeah. the soulful human connection, right, is just the, the thing that really always pulls me in. Um, yeah. And Coltrane, I think, came back to that in his, you know, his later, some of his later stuff was really expressive. Like what, what record? You know, um, like I find uh, Love the uh, love Supreme to be. Love's, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say that the, the other aspect of this that I've moved into, for better or for worse, in my last, I'd say last 10 years is free improvisation, which I know seems antithetical to what we just listened to, but, mm-hmm. you know, non-referential uh, improvisation. Um, I think you've heard me do a, a little bit of that on our driveway last summer. I think yeah. um, <laughs> I did a little free cadenza thing that left the neighbors running for cover, I think. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you know, um, I'm talking about, you know, the European style improvisation where you don't play really a recognized jazz language. You play, you know, some people would say squawks, squeaks, and grunts, but I found that to be actually also very personally to be very expressive. You can really, I feel like you can really express some emotions through sound that way when you're not concerned about playing, you know, in key centers or 
a particular, uh, you know, trying to to resolve a, a you know, a, um, a dominant seventh in an interesting way or something. So, anyway, that's that's another thing I've kind of gotten into. That makes sense. Um, and and speaking of of playing the saxophone, what is the most important thing to being a masterful saxophone player or woodwind player that most people, most players, don't know or spend enough time on? Um, you know, it, for me, the answer would be fairly simple, and that is tone. If you don't have an appealing tone, it doesn't matter what follows from it. It's it's not going to connect with the listener. And um, so work on your tone. And if that, you know, it's usually a combination of listening. So you're emulating beautiful, and it, not necessarily even listening to other saxophone players or saxophone music. Listening to something, someone that has a beautiful sound on whatever it is that they play or sing, um, I think that can that somehow translates inside the head, so that when you play, you're you've got some piece of that. You said Frank Sinatra earlier, and yeah, I'm a great Frank Sinatra fan too. And maybe there's even a little of his sound in my sound. I don't know, uh, probably unconsciously, but I can you know Miles Davis for me. I, I love his sound uh, on trumpet and. Uh, unconsciously, I might, you know, um, pull some of that in, um, and uh, so, so tone. And then I think, you know, the the other part is um, at some point uh, uh, technique. I mean, you, you have to be able to get around the instrument, right? Um, and and be convincing that way. Um, but yeah, um, long tones. Um, uh, you know, I, I still I do. I'm when I I've been off my, my horn a few days, but. I've been trying to do a 45 minute warm up every day mm-hmm. and the first 15 minutes of it is warm ups and I, in fact I adopted something James Galway did when he was in Calgary 20 years ago and he got his warm up from Luciano Pavarotti so I'm doing actually a Pav- Pavarotti warm up that that takes me through all 12 keys um, and it's kind of a ritual but it's it just allows you to think about how beautiful you want your sound to be wow yeah um I agree. I spend about an hour every day just on warm up, warm up, and it's uh, a lot of long tone and through the whole register. Like well, for me, down the pedal tones and up, and but it's funny because anybody we talk, I talk to about that, it it usually comes back to tone um, and long tones for wind yeah. instruments, which of course takes care of tone and and tuning and um, even helps us with endurance. And but yeah, that's um, what about when it comes to be to becoming a successful woodwind doubler. Um, because I, I just expect you guys now to be able to play all these. I just go, Hey, uh, here's all the <laughs> flutes and here's uh, now I'm going to write for this. And now, and some of it is when you come to me once and you said, I want to do more flute stuff with CJO and even into sweet jubilation. I think it was in, uh, the song original sin. I wrote a, a, a flute feature and flute parts and, mm-hmm. but the, uh, so how, how do you maintain I know for me it's it's tricky being like keep maintaining my voice and uh, trumpet like like improvising as well as technique and then the flugelhorn, um, yeah. let alone anything else I have to do. But how how do you do that? Like like uh, and the flute especially is a completely different embouchure and instrument. Like yeah, um, let me see here. Well, let's see just the. I mean, I pick up my flute and it's like, how do I describe this? It's like when you pick up the trumpet, there's just this whole kind of uh, thing that clicks in place. It's the face, it's right. the, the the fingers, the, the kinesthetic attachment to the instrument. Um, it's it's a it's in some ways you can't really describe it. It's just a familiarity and a comfort that comes from just spending you know a lot of time with the instrument and certainly a tonal concept. Um, of the instrument, um, the uh, you know when I pick up the flute, I immediately know sort of the sound that I want to get, which is a, a relatively uh, classical sound. Although I would say I listened to Hubert Laws for so many hours growing up. I mean, I had every one of his albums, and you know when I listen to Hubert Laws, I hear a classically trained uh, fl- flautist who played jazz, and that's kind of been my model um, ever since. Clarinet. 
um, absolutely a classical approach to the instrument. Um, and then when you've, you've asked me to play some, uh, you know, Dixie clarinet and some jazz clarinet in the CJO, which I'm really glad you did because that was the first time I think I'd done that. No then way. I, th- <laughs> Wow. So I use my baseline classical stuff, and then I stretch, you know, I, I loosen up things here and change things to get that more of a Dixie quality. But I always come back to a classical uh, approach um, on on the clarinet, and it's been a lot of practicing. Um, not so much, you know, um, true confessions. I don't pro- I don't practice the, the instruments every day anymore. Um, but when I have a show coming up for Theater Calgary, for instance, which I've been doing for I mean you know, 25 more years. Um, months in advance, I start a regime, like getting ready on each of those instruments several months in advance. Um, and that works for me. And the penny whistle, you mentioned that. I've got to be careful because I'm, I'm really infatuated with playing the penny whistle, but what, can I don't you play think us? anyone else is. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's infatuated with listening. They're, they're not infatuated with your infatuation, would be that. Well, and you just say penny whistle. My my students at the university, I, one of my my graduate students said, Are "You sure you want to confess that you play the penny whistle?" And well, okay. Well, now you have to play something on the penny whistle. It's I'm. You know what? It's not. I'm sorry. It's it's buried under a bunch of stuff. I can't get to it. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe we'll maybe we'll have you do it at a Calgary Jazz Orchestra show then. Absolutely. Well, sure. Sure. Um, so that brings up something that's a, a question I had later, but the, so I, I love the writers and the players. And of course, Benny Goodman himself that played in the Benny Goodman big band and, and back in the day. Um, and the Benny Goodman show we did uh, with the CJO, it was a lot of fun. And we featured you on clarinet. And I remember asking you first, right. you know, are you interested in this? Would you like to do this? And yeah. if not, I, we probably won't do it. Because without that soloist sound, it, it's not the same. Um, and then um, uh, it was fun for me because I got to focus on playing lead trumpet for the whole show, which I, I don't normally get to do anymore. Um, but I kept getting distracted and all of us in the band did uh, by your playing. Uh, you killed it. The audience mm. and the band. And we, I mean, we were just so shocked. Uh, we mm. were in awe of the playing you did on that show. Um, so, so how... So, so, so you've, you've already talked about doubling and some of the things you changed for clarinet, but how did you prepare for that? Was it a lot of listening and daily regimented practice? It was, yes, it was some listening for sure. I mean, um, uh, I'm familiar with Benny Goodman with his, um, his, his, uh, what they, his quintets from the 1930s, I think. Um, uh, is that with, with Teddy Wilson uh, and Teddy Lionel Wilson, Hampton, Lionel like Hampton. the trios and the, yeah. Yeah. All those little consorts, um, yeah. um, produced by the way, by Norman Grants, who did, doesn't get much credit for that. But uh, uh, anyway, um, yeah. And Artie Shaw, you know, a, another fine uh, player, um, on, on, on the instrument. Um, yes, I did practice. Um, you know, Johnny, it's the same thing that we've been talking about this evening. It's like, the terror of failing, you, you know, of, of, of not wanting to fail. So every time I, I thought, well, you know, I think I'll, I, I, I'll watch a television show or something, then I think, oh, no, I've got to practice that, those licks on that, you know, those tunes that you, you gave me. So discipline. Discipline, absolutely. And then isolating, you know, I'm, I'm really big on uh, the scholarship of teaching and learning, it's called subtle. I, I just a little introduction to that teaching or class at the university, mm-hmm. but you know, it's, they're big on um, breaking things down. You know, this whole notion of breaking things down, isolation, repetition, and then put it back together. Yes. Um, which I, you know, I know musicians, we've been doing that for decades, right? I mean, that's what yeah. we do, but I'm even more into um, scanning the terrain of a piece and I don't pay much attention to 60% of it. And I'm just focusing on that, you know, the, the 30, 40% that really needs some attention right. and, uh, and, and spend time on that. Um, but fundamentally, you know, the other part of this is that <clears throat> not so much anymore, but I spent, you know, again, it sounds like hyperbole, but I did spend decades working on technique. <clears throat> I mean, I, you know, getting ready for a show, I would practice at least as much on arpeggio scales uh, in such things um, as I would on the music itself, because the the technique informs whatever else that you want to do, right. makes it easy. 
Right. So yeah, just, you know. So discipline, mm -hmm. uh, efficiency, efficiency, yeah. And smart practicing, smart, pra intelligent practicing, practicing what you don't know. And, yeah. uh, and, and, and being a, a, a bad arse on the instrument. Those, that's basically what you are, <laughs> you're, you're leaning on then. Um, piece of cake that folks, there's nothing to it. All, all it takes is 30 years of dedicated study and then you can, you can do it in a matter of months. Um, <laughs> I remember, I remember when I was first, I first moved to Calgary. Um, <clears throat> I'm, you know, fairly modest, I guess it used to, you know, I, I'd like to think I'm fairly modest about things, but I, I confessed to the contractor for a show. I said, I'm a pretty good, I'm a good flute player. I'm a good saxophone player. My clarinet, you know, not so great. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't know is that compared to maybe other, some other folks, it was pretty good, but I confessed that. So of course, you know what happens the, the first rehearsal, the band basically is shut down and then they say, clarinet player, play that. So by <laughs> myself, I had to play, you know, this clarinet part. And thankfully I'd practiced it because I, you know, I thought I was a pretty lame clarinet player yeah. and they thought it was great. They said, what do you mean? You're, you know, you're really good. <laughs> so anyway, but that, that, that brings up another issue, which is our, our perception of ourselves. Yeah. Um, and it can go both ways. I, I can perceive because my musical concept is something that I enjoy and that I think is going to come off really well, but I didn't do the practice because I watched TV shows instead of putting the instrument in my hands and, and focusing the time. And now I'm on stage and my perception is I played really well, but when I listen to a recording or see a video, I go, Oh, wow. Yeah. That's not, that's not really <clears throat> very good. Um, and then yeah. the other perception is, is when we're too hard on ourselves and we, we think, you know, we're, we don't know all things about all things. So we, um, that's tough too. And we get inside our own heads a lot as musicians, don't we, for that? We sure do. And I know a lot of musicians that are, you know, they're really, they're really hard on themselves and you can, you can, um, you know, you can really be unhappy. I think if you, if you forget the, if you don't forget, you know, you have to remember you're, you're human and you're going to make mistakes. It's not going to be perfect. And yeah. in fact, you know, I play with the Calgary Philharmonic <clears throat> as their saxophonist quite a bit, especially mm -hmm. on the classical stuff and have for a long time. And, you know, it, it, it doesn't terrify me. I shouldn't say that, but I'll have to say that my anxiety level is pretty high because as you pointed out earlier, you're not only playing for the audience who probably is not going to hear mistakes that you make really, but you're playing for 80 musicians on stage around you, which is even a much more critical audience than and, you know, and the, the thousand patrons in, coming in as the specialist on an instrument in a, in yeah. a style at the same time, those musicians, you know, some of them are very versatile and others, uh, the, probably the majority of, of, of most symphonies, that's their focus and their, their, their daily existence is, is, is that style, those styles right. or that umbrella of music. And, uh, and, and you're focusing in on all these other things and education and conducting and all these, and now you come in and it, you're right. It's daunting, right? Like it is, but, totally. um, you know what Al Muirhead said to me once? I was nervous on stage and uh, I was playing right beside him and I think he knew I was nervous and he grabbed my arm and he said, how are you feeling? I'm like, I'm good. And uh, I had to do some pretty crazy trumpet playing and he goes, just remember, nobody out there can do what you're about to try to do. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, on this instrument. And I'm like, okay, then, yeah. you know, I'll just do my best. That's right. But, yeah. um, Okay, what, what's, uh, speaking of music education, there's just a question I wanted to ask you. This, this might be too huge to talk about, or it might be too simple, I don't know, but where is there the most room for improvement in music education? Well, I think that would be uh, a discussion that, could, you know, that, can, that could occur at a, a bunch of different levels. So mm -hmm. I'll start out by saying at the lofty realms of music education at the university level, where there's a lot of research going on <clears throat> in various places, you know, in mm -hmm. the university milieu, that um, they would have lots of opinions about um, the perhaps, per, not, again, I'm not taking this point of view, perhaps the overemphasis on um, 
large ensembles, for instance, and the la uh, not enough emphasis on maybe more chamber music or, or basic musical skills. Um, so uh, I think that there is that argument out there that maybe kids spend too much time maybe playing in large large groups and that time could be better spent with private instruction or chamber music or some such thing um, musicianship training maybe even improvisation because they would be more useful in the in the current modern world of music yeah yeah um, and you know I far be it from me to 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 take a stand on what how to, to improve um, music education because I think that I mean I'll have to say that there's just no more hardworking teachers than the music teacher in a particular school, generally speaking. I mean, there, there's so many responsibilities uh, of organization and bureaucracy and Assets. discipline. And finances. Finances. The amount, um, the amount their room is worth of instruments. And yeah. And they have to budget for that. And they have mm -hmm. to have a plan to replace instruments. Um, you know, and, and I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really daunting task and a lot of it's not music uh, d based in in music it's you know the non-musical stuff that's kind of discouraging the um, administrative side of i mean for me know, i've i've had that a lot as the business side of music the administrative side is always monstrous yeah you know yeah i mean so, so my my answer would be a very utopian one would be that you know the existing realm is pretty good but let's add more um, chamber music, um, individual instruction, and I, I would be a big uh, fan of teaching improvisation, creativity to all students. And not and when I say improvisation, not jazz necessarily. It could be. No, just improvising. Just improv improvisation, making uh, melodies and sounds, uh, you know, in a creative way, both individually and in, and in small groups. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, yeah. I totally agree with you in, in all of that. I hadn't thought of the, especially around the, improvisational side i never really thought about that the the large group thing but i guess it's it's easier when you have a ton of students to put them in a in a large ensemble um it's easier to it seems like that's e that would be easier right it's less administration because we know how much work all that is um wow cool um if you could um no i'll save this question for later um yeah. So let's talk about the Calgary Jazz Orchestra. Um, what's your What's your favorite uh, show that we've done? Oh man, um, well let's see. Favorite show. I I I like them all. Um, I think the the show that what was the the show that I had the tenor solo. Uh, the big, t the huge apocryphal tenor solo. Um, the, the Channel Ken One Suite. Channel One Suite. Buddy Rich. Yeah. Yeah, with the Buddy Rich. I'll have to say that I loved that chart as a kid, and you know I still love it. And the chance to play it, you know, with a really good band, that was a thrill. But the the other shows, I always like the Christmas shows. I mean, I just, <laughs> I just, I just, I just think it's you know, they're they're just a blast. Me too. It's uh, and and it's funny because everybody has mentioned that. Um, every player yeah. it, it just feels like Christmas to me when we get to do that um, yeah the um, uh, do you have any funny or interesting stories you can think about from the things that we've done with the CJO well you know the there's there's always funny stuff I mean you, you, you probably familiar with those books jazz anecdotes you know yeah. there's a couple of couple, they're pretty hilarious you know but what yeah. in traditionally what jazz musicians do to each other's um, and by the way, you know the not to go down this uh, rabbit hole, but you know jazz traditionally is very uh, gender specific. I mean, it's it's a man's pursuit. It's about men, uh, and one of the phrases I, I like is uh, "men worshiping at the altar of other men." Um, <laughs> and oh, but no. it's true. It's true. You know, and now that's changing. Thank goodness. With there's yeah. a lot of fabulous women now. Yes. But, you know, we were talking before the show about Lil Hardin Armstrong, who played piano. She was one of the few women that had a, a jazz career um, as a woman. And she, but she played piano, which was a little bit more acceptable. But, you know, she went on, one of her interviews, she went on a record as saying, you know, when she was playing with the Hot Five and when she was playing with King Oliver in Chicago at the Royal Garden, there would be, you know, people, 
the men coming streaming through the doors to listen to the band play because they wanted to hear Louis Armstrong. You know, it was the King Oliver jazz band. Right. And she said, no one ever came up to me. She said, not one man ever came up to talk to me as a woman piano player. Um, hmm. So anyway, I, this whole this whole gender uh, thing is uh, um, something that uh, I think is rightfully getting in, in the spotlight. And we're trying to you know encourage uh, uh, women, young women, to uh, to become a part of uh, of jazz uh, music. And I just forgot the question that you asked me a moment ago. <laughs> No, let's talk about that. So um, now, because you and I could could talk about so many incredible women in jazz through the history of jazz and, and yeah. music in general. Um, we uh, This was something that Sarah and I talked about a couple weeks ago as well. And mm -hmm. the, you know, one of the, the most, I guess maybe it, I'd say it's tribal or just just kind of humanistic that when when you're a young child and you're a young female child and you see a woman on stage playing you think oh i could do that it doesn't seem daunting if if you can empathize if you can see or see anything even if it's just a you know a physical resemblance or something that draws you in it um, and so it becomes very important to make sure that we can represent as as much as we can um, in our in our performances in gender. Um, but I I once talked to a piano player who's a friend of ours, but and I'm sure she'd be fine with me using the quotation, but I won't say her name just in case. But she was saying uh, that it that the thing that's forgotten the most is the importance of of women being seen. Uh, doing things that they're not traditionally doing because that's when the next generation of these uh, incredible genius people will come up and they won't be dispelled because they think that it's uh, only, well, yeah, but only guys really get to do that, even though that would never be verbally said and yeah. it would probably be verbally uh, supported in the opposite. There, There's this tribal feeling when you, when you, you connect on a different level with um, with that and I know that I know that uh, that Sarah has been that in our in our group for years and years and years now for when we do the, the school tours um, and and we see the kids they, they look at her and they just cheer and scream they think it's the coolest thing ever yeah. um, especially because she's very glamorous and and she's a total Star Wars geek and when that comes out and they they see that too they just they, they know that it's okay for them to be themselves. Um, but, uh, and I know, and so you mentioned Monica um, uh, uh, Herzog, Herzig. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I met her um, years ago, uh, touring in the States, I think in hunting in, in West Virginia or something. Okay. Um, she was at a university that I was with, uh, at with E. Um, so how... Uh, you're working on something with her and and gender in in music and in jazz music. What are you what are you working on and and how do we uh, move that forward? Yeah, she she is the um, we've never met. She's but she's the editor of the um, uh, we've corresponded by email a couple of times. She's the editor of the Jazz Educators Network, their, their scholarly um, uh, division, I suppose mm -hmm. you you could say. And so um, I. Um, volunteered to write a, a book chapter of a forthcoming, um, I think they call it a handbook, um, with uh, numerous chapters by various authors on jazz and gender, topics related to gender and uh, jazz music. And as I mentioned to you before the show, my chapter was on Helen Moore, or Helen Joyner as uh, her maiden name, and uh, who's the wife of, uh, common law wife of Lee Morgan and Lil Hardin Armstrong, the second wife of uh, Louis Armstrong. And um, the, uh, it not only illuminated their lives as, as uh, women who, you know, uh, supported their men, I suppose you could say, and, and, and boosted their careers to heights that probably, uh, arguably would not have occurred without them, um, but they received very little recognition of that. But it also illuminated the whole notion of women uh, and their 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 careers in jazz. I mean, there was a, um, you know, for me, I, I 
this is as new to me as it is for a lot of other men, uh, mus male musicians in engaged with jazz. I can remember when Stan Kenton in the 1970s, I think it was, brought in the first woman to play saxophone in the Stan Kenton band. Um, that was big. That was a big deal. Hmm. Um, and uh, I mean, it took to the 1970s for that to happen. I think there's a trombonist that played with Count Basie, uh, his band, um, and then the, you know here and there, women instrumentalists and I mean vocalists, the Alberta Hunter and Bessie Smith and you know Ella Fitzgerald, they've always been a part of jazz, but that's a glamorous you know role mm -hmm. that is okay. You know, men say that's okay for the the, the woman to to sing, play piano, mm, maybe you know Lil Hardin got away with it in Chicago. She went to New York with uh, Lewis when she was playing with Fletcher Henderson. She was unknown, and she didn't. And they wouldn't even, you know, give her any uh, credit at all for what she was doing. Wow. So, yeah. So, um, and they went back to Chicago, and it was it was good. It was it was, apparently it was okay again with her her reputation there. So, you know, I'm just it, for me, it's a it's a very interesting field. Um, it's new to me. Just the last couple of years mm -hmm. uh, dealing with. Uh, but your question about how to further it, I think, um, ex, you know, the obvious answer is just to seek out and encourage and provide uh, role models for yeah. young women uh, and support them and, and sustain them in a realm of music that is undoubtedly and undeniably male uh, dominated and has been for decades. Right. Yeah. The, I mean, it's it's coming because it's been around so long. It came from when society was very male dominated and. I, you know, it's it for for me and for when I grew up, um, you know, pretending that I actually grew up. Um, the <laughs> no, you never, you never really did. That's... Never really matured. The yeah. um, the I I think. See, I always had friends that were in all the bands and that I went to school with, and they were men and women. And I, you never thought about that. I never thought about me, me gender too. or race or. I just, these are just, these, I, I, that person's nice and that one's not. That was really my, you know, or that one, that one, yeah. um, that one plays extremely well and I need to go practice more. Like it yeah. wasn't, um, I didn't care about, uh, I didn't care about gender and I don't yeah. care about gender when I'm hiring or what I'm, but I think that that's, for me, I've noticed for myself, that's part of the problem. I need to make sure that, that we provide role models, um, you know, so that, that, like I was mentioning earlier, but it's, um. I think it's, especially when you talk about Lil Armstrong, I mean, you know, that's now we're in the 1920s and she was a member of the Hot Fives, of course. And um, so for her, in, in some of the most influential origins of jazz records and recordings, at the time to not be recognized is, is, is mind blowing to me. You just assume that she would be because, of course, I look at it from my modern eyes, you know. Like, um, so we must have it seems like at least like society is moving in the right direction that way and, and that our art society is. Oh, I think so. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it's, it, it, it's, it's really, a, you know, a lot of things are, are really positive and Jazz YYC, you know, I'm on the board of that. We're the mm -hmm. educational outreach uh, that we're engaged in. Um, you know, we're having a conversation all the time about how we can balance the, the and welcome the young uh, women into the, into the realm, and we are. I mean, there's there, there's there's a, a number of, of young women in the band, the lab band that we that we sponsor, and we're looking to ex consistently expand and draw on that, and look at what other people are doing, what the research shows, and you know how do we change uh, the perception. But you know, it's um, you just need to go back to the recordings, you know, the Blue Note recordings in the 1940s and 50s, and there you go. There's the, you know the male dominated world of jazz music and and we're all happy with it and love it but um yeah it's it's good that it's changing yeah for sure um <clears throat> okay you have to sing a song with the cjo what song would you sing jingle bells jingle bells okay um let's talk uh cars okay because i know you like cars um, what is the best car you've owned and why? Best car I've ever owned, I have to say, was a Fleetwood Brougham 1968 Cadillac, uh, 472 cubic inch V8, um, 
when I bought it, it had, my parents bought it for me, it had 105,000 miles on it. Okay. And um, was the longest motor vehicle probably ever produced by in Detroit. I mean, it was huge. But, oh, man, I love that car. And what of course year, I, what I, year did you say it was? I, I want to look at a picture. Of yeah, in 19, 1968. Um, it was Burgundy. I bought it from uh, the Sneva uh, family organization in downtown Spokane. It was a reconditioned car from California. It's huge. They're, they're boats. The stack <laughs> headlights. Yeah. And I was in love with every inch of that, that, uh, that car. And, wow. Um, yeah, I even took it up to Grand Prairie and uh, drove it around northern Alberta for a while. Why did you sell it? Well, the, the shocks, for instance, I had air shocks. Um, in northern Alberta, the, the, they kept blowing up, like the, mm. the material used to, to, to keep the, the shock absorber system going wouldn't it, withstand minus 40. The winter, right? The winter, yeah. Gosh. Um, yeah, and it was a gas guzzler. It, you know, there was a, you know, mechanical problems and that sort of thing. So. Would you buy one today? Um, I would just for fun. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I would certainly, and I, I regret that I, that my parent, I just told my parents to go ahead and sell it, um, 25, 30 years ago because it was just being in storage. Right. But yeah, I'd love to recondition now and, and work on it. I just found one. I just found a 65 for 35,000. So maybe, um, yikes. Let's see, there we go. <laughs> what, a, what a fool. What a what stylistic a fool. car this is though. It uh, it looks very um, classy yet gangsterish. Absolutely, know, there's, there's a bit of bad car. bad boy in there, <laughs> for sure. Wow, that's cool. Okay, yeah. Fleetwood Brom. Um, what about motorbikes? Do you do you, uh, do you, I, I know we've talked a little bit in the past. You like motorbikes? What uh, are you? Do you ride yeah. one right now? I, I don't. I, I I used to. Yeah, uh, I had a Suzuki a Katana. Uh, what was it? A Katana? No, I had a, I had a, a Katana. A, 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 a Kawasaki Katana, I think it was. And I had a 600 uh, Suzuki. I don't remember the model number. This was back in the 90s. Uh, yeah. Um, but I'll tell you, uh, when I see Ducatis go by, oh, the, the exhaust sound on a Ducati, I think it's incomparable. I think I'd have to I'd have to say my favorite bike today would be a, some kind of uh, Ducati. And they make one of my, I think you might like this too, my favorite thing with the motorbikes today is the um, the throwback style. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. a modern bike, but they have a, a 60s cafe racer look to them. Cafe racer look, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I like I, that uh, a lot. I, I just bought a bike. So You um, did? Yeah, it's not get? a Ducati. I got a BMW R9T racer. Oh, nice. Um, so it has that old school throwback look to it, but it's yeah. uh, it's a modern bike. So you should get a Ducati, so then, then we'll go riding. That sounds fun. Love to. Um, <laughs> I'm going to start sending you ads for Ducati's. For sale. If anyone uh, uh, listening has a Ducati for sale, let me know. Um, the uh, oh, and Norm says hi. Hi, Norm. Uh, thanks for saying hi. Uh, okay, so uh, is there anything? I'm gonna we're gonna go into the the the, the quick question round at the end. Uh, is there anything else you want to talk about or mention, or anyone you want to say hi to? Um, well, um, just hi to everyone that's that's uh, tuned in tonight. Thanks for. For listening, I I, uh, I admire you for for uh, for listening to these shows online. I'm not a myself. I'm I should uh, true confessions. I don't. I, I've taught so many hundreds of hours probably the last 18 months on Zoom that uh, I usually don't go back to it for fun. But yeah, uh, <laughs> and understood. And Johnny, uh, Johnny, I'm grateful for all the work you've done with the, the CJO, of course, and your friendship and. Uh, you know all that so thanks oh my pleasure thank you and i can't wait to get back to playing yeah. um yeah. cjo is uh i think it's it's the the board said they're going to announce in a couple of days but i think we're starting up in october so we're uh, because of everything up. happened we're we're hoping that that's gonna be the be the opening and i i still don't know what our first show should be actually i'm that's I'm, kind of fun though kind of exciting to have that kind of unsettled yeah <laughs> maybe we'll just call it the mystery show the mystery show and just see what just come and see what you get i don't know my calgary, I, uh, wind, symphony's, calgary wind symphony's going back in october too the group i conduct the mm -hmm. wind band and uh yeah we just settled in our program so but not completely what do you like, what is it can i steal the idea 
Um, oh, I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> I don't have a memory for that. Uh, I think it's, oh yeah, it's, it's a celebration. Um, we're doing the Clifton Williams fanfare and celebration and a, a piece by um, a British composer, is it Martin Ellaby, um, called Jubil Jubil uh, Jubiloso or Jubilee, I think. Awesome. Um, so yeah, it's going to be fun. I, I want to do something that's the same, celebratory, but, uh, but I, don't know, I, I don't know what that's going to be yet. Um, you know, it won't be a blues show, I guess, would be what... <laughs> Maybe not a blues <laughs> Not a blues show. Um, okay, um, here we go. So, first thing that comes to mind, unless, of course, you want to extrapolate. Uh, oh, and Bob says hi. Hi, Bob. Uh, enjoyed having you last week. Hey, Bob. Um, okay, what do you think of people calling your instrument a saxophone? Endearing. Endearing. Uh, if you could do anything else uh, for a living, professionally, for a day, what would it be? Oh, man. Uh, a minister. Wow. A preacher. Very cool. Yeah. I, I mean, I've heard you preach through your saxophone many times, so I don't <laughs> think that would be a stretch. And I'm, I'm not kidding. Okay. Uh, what is your proudest accomplishment? Well, um, I think, I, this sounds sappy, but I think that my parents thought I was a good kid. So I'm happy that my parents thought I was a good kid. That's the second awesome. thing would be, the second thing, probably more pragmatic, would be my book that came out of a couple of years ago. Right. We didn't talk about that. And you literally wrote the book on Henry Cowell. Yeah. Um, his wind, wind band music. Yeah. Right. His, specifically his wind band music, yeah. which is beautiful and still sounds to me, sounds very relevant and uh, fresh when I hear it. Yeah. It's um, good music. Yeah. Where? Okay. So, so if someone were to check out Henry Cowell's wind band music, what's a recording that we can point them towards? Um, a piece called Shun Three. Um, How do you spell that? -O. It's, it's a music of sleep. It's, a, it's an Irish. It's the opposite of a lullaby. It's music that in, uh, increases in intensity as you go to sleep and then dissipates as you wake up. That's a Shun Three. Wow. Uh, and it's very cool. One of Cowell's best known works. Yeah. Okay. Shun yeah. Three. Um, and where, where could they, if they're interested in, in reading your book, um, mm -hmm. where can they get a copy? Um, a lot of online, uh, Amazon has it, um, uh, in, uh, Indigo, any of the usual booksellers. You so they can, can Google on, it. You can Google it and it, yeah, it'll come up. There's uh, I think there's a, over my shoulder, you can see the other shoulder, you can see a copy of it, but it's published by Rutledge. Um, there's, it's out in soft, softback, uh, an ebook and a hardback and the hard, hard cover and the hard cover is $165. So you might want to go for the. The cheaper the, version. The soft cover, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Okay. Um, what is your favorite sport to watch? Football. In yeah, a movie America. made about your life, who should play you? Lyle Lovett. Lyle Lovett. Uh, okay, all right on. I was not expecting that. Um, uh, he'd have to learn all the fingerings on the saxophone, though, for that. But he wouldn't have to get a haircut. I, I, I don't think. That's he, right. He'd blend. He'd, yeah. he'd blend in. Um, yeah. What is a crazy adventure you'd love to take in your life? Um, hmm. Good question. I, I think I don't know if it's crazy or not, but I've I've always had a uh, an urge to travel to Patagonia. Southern South America or South Argentina towards wow. the uh, Antarctic. Yeah. Why? Why do you want to go there? I read a book by Bruce Chatwin many years ago. He was basically a travel writer, a kind of sort of quasi fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the Bruce Chatwin books, he died, unfortunately, very, very, uh, as a young man. But uh, this particular book was uh, maybe it was called In Patagonia. I can't remember. Anyway, it was a terrific book. And it just it was so in, I was so enthralled with the way he described, you know, the, the, the icy waters and the, you know, the, 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 the countryside. It was just really, it was really cool. Oh, wow. That's, I mean, that's, 
that's a, a, a proof uh, of, of how powerful uh, art, music, writing, literature, mm -hmm. dance, film can be that it would that it would inspire a, a life choice and an adventure like that from you. That's interesting. Yeah, no, it's true. I didn't. I'm not making that up. But <laughs> it's true. Um, do you dance when listening to music at home or maybe while you're cleaning or while you're cooking or do you dance? I, I do some moves, particularly when I want to amuse uh, Lisa, who's actually a, dan a trained dancer. She uh, she has a dance degree. Okay. And so, yeah. So sometimes I'll, I'll make, you know, I'll do a little thing just to draw a smile on her face. <laughs> okay. If you could have a superpower, what would it be? Uh, oh, man. Um, I think the ability to swim underwater for as long as I wanted and surface just at will and then go back down and swim underwater. I would love oh, to do that. That would be fun. Yeah. Um, uh, have you ever fallen asleep while taking a class? Yes. <laughs> at Ohio State. It was a, a contemporary music class and I woke up just in time to see the professor glare at me and give me the death stare, um, which <laughs> led to the only B minus in my entire career, I think. Uh, yes. <laughs> He hated me after that. He hated uh, me. Did you I ever catch worry. any of us falling asleep in any of the rehearsals? Uh -huh. You did? Yeah. yeah. It wasn't me, though, was it? I don't, I don't think so, but I don't I, think I, I've seen a lot of nodding going on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I have fallen asleep while taking a class. It just wasn't yours. Um, <laughs> Thank God. Have you, have you ever fallen asleep while teaching? Um, no. I, I've had a couple moments, though, of trying to look thoughtful when I'm tired with a student. This is very rare. And I put my head down and I momentarily have a, a, a little moment of maybe just a slight sleepy moment. But <laughs> it's few and far between. <laughs> I haven't in any recent years, but I remember when I was in university, I was, I was teaching and it was just apparent that the parent was just paying me to be a, a babysitter, babysitter once a week. And the, 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 the child was not practicing and um, had no interest. I don't think in pretty much anything. And uh, I, I completely fell asleep when they were playing something because <laughs> I was just so tired. And I was, I was right out. And when they finished, I went, oh, oh, that was good. Let's try it again. <laughs> <laughs> Grab another 20 weeks. This time with feeling, yeah. <laughs> man oh, we're, we're all just human you know pretty much um okay uh, uh do mermaids do they have live babies or do they lay eggs i, I think i have it on quite good authority that they lay eggs and okay. they're they're rather large and um and they have a pink tinge <laughs> it's, it's very uh, uh very descriptive um what is the most creative and intelligent insult that you could create right now? Um, I think it would, it would probably be something to do. Uh, it's, I'm not so fully sure I follow your, your question, but I could say that I could come up with something for a former U.S. president that, that <laughs> be, um, may be on the verge of being unkind. Um, okay. <laughs> um, uh, what uh, what musical instrument has the most annoying sound to you? Uh, you know, I like I just like I just about every instrument. You know, I I, I mean I I even love the hurdy gurdy, um, which some people would find terrible. I, I I like the hurdy gurdy and uh, I like the oboe and I like the banjo. Uh, I even like bagpipes. Um, I, I like certain amounts of bagpipes for yeah certain that's a good way to put it yeah, yeah certain yeah everything within you know you can't have three milkshakes but one is okay like bagpipes <laughs> kind of a similar thing um, so Johnny I, I would say maybe a poorly played um, uh, oboe a poorly played oboe would be um, yeah fair enough uh, do you play oboe yes yeah do you play it well or poorly. Today, I would play it poorly. <laughs> yeah. 
very poorly. Uh, very yeah. poorly. Well, yeah. I would play it very, very poorly. So, um, uh, awesome. Thanks so much for uh, for uh, joining me tonight, Jeremy. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, it's been it's a been pleasure. great fun, and I, I always uh, enjoy spending time with you, Johnny. So, um, thanks for having me. Same to me, Jeremy, and thanks for everyone uh, for tuning in. Uh, join uh, join me next week, and I I can't. I, I should always have this ready, and I never do. I can't remember who my guest is next week, but um, I'm sure they're fascinating. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, check out the next episode next week. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, for listening. And, uh, uh, and we'll see you then. Uh, have a good night. Good night.